Happy Earth Day, everybody. 50 of these. 50 Earth Days. Uh, I know the environment isn't necessarily the first thing on everybody's mind during this global pandemic, and that makes sense. Uh, but at the same time, I think this pandemic can serve as a good lesson as to what happens when you don't pay attention to science and to scientists. And, and, and in my country, anyway, here in the United States, it's pretty clear that uh, some of the suffering and bad outcomes that we're seeing unfold right now might have been lessened or avoided had our leadership paid more attention and been more interested in, in acting on knowledge produced by scientists and evidence and proper research. And um, what's happening with climate change right now is, is not going to happen as fast as what happened with this pandemic, but it's happening just as undoubtedly and the outcomes could be just as disastrous, even if more gradual and, and, and sort of in slow motion. So let's maybe take this opportunity today, Earth Day, make a plan. What can we do to elect leaders that respect science and are wanting to build their policies based on facts and information and evidence that scientists gather? Um, seems like something good to do to honor our Earth. Thanks. And uh, again, happy Earth Day. And thank you so much to Elizabeth Warren and Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who had a little technical glitch, but was showing us what it would look like, I guess, Southern Hemisphere going global with our broadcast upside down. Um, so now we're moving into a new section of the evening, and we're focusing on climate science and solutions. At Earth Day Initiative, we are constantly asked, what's one thing I can do? People are really clamoring to hear what they can do in their own lives, in their own communities. Obviously, anyone in the environmental community agrees that systemic change is what we need, but people really need that individual connection and they want to see organizations and their own community and people in their own lives being able to connect to the larger climate solutions. So we have campaigns where we try to connect people to that, the Do Just One Thing campaign. So if you go to our website, do just one, the number one thing.org. You can find out all about the sustainability partners we have. We have some amazing sustainability commitments there. You can also find out what you can do in a matter of minutes in your own life. And we're talking about the broader themes of sustainability solutions going into this next segment. And first, we're going to talk a bit about the science. And we have Kate Marvel, who is a climate scientist and author. And then Lucy Biggers is going to help out with some Q&A from now this. I will let you take it away, Kate. All right. Hello, hi. So nice to be here. Um, am I on? All right, great. Um, so I wanna start with some things that are true, whether or not you believe them. When you burn a fossil fuel for energy, you release carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Humans have put a lot of it in the atmosphere. And as a result, the average temperature has risen by about a degree Celsius since the Industrial Revolution. Okay, here's why that matters. Warm air holds more water vapor. So when it rains, it pours. But warm air is thirstier air and it drives more evaporation away from the surface. So a warmer world means more floods and more droughts. Rising temperatures melt ice sheets and thermally expand ocean water, which raise sea levels and threaten coastal cities like the city where I live. Warm water is hurricane food. Warm, dry forests are fuel for fires. Spring's coming earlier, winter's getting weirder. So I'm a scientist. I make climate change happen over and over again on a computer. And I do this to understand the impact of different choices and explore different futures. But here's the thing. Climate change doesn't happen on a computer. Climate change happens here in the world we've built. Our choices dictate where people live, what resources they have, and how they treat each other. But while human actions are causing climate change, not all humans bear equal responsibility. CO2 mixes well in the atmosphere, which means it doesn't matter where emissions originate. But this doesn't spread the responsibility for these emissions out evenly. Thousands of years of history have given a very small subset of us the power to constrain the choices of the rest. A computer model of the climate system can demonstrate the impacts of changing the composition of the atmosphere, but it's less useful for understanding the actions that led to that change. So on my computer, I can set off a volcano or turn down the sun or knock the earth slightly out of its orbit. 
I can increase carbon dioxide with the push of a button. But in the real world, the increase in carbon dioxide comes from a society that uses a lot of fossil fuel. And that reality is governed by a very specific set of choices made by a very few people in power, dependent on a very specific arc of history. Carbon dioxide emissions aren't gonna decrease because a scientist pushes a button. They'll decrease because of political action. So some people say science isn't political, but honestly, who do they think is doing the science? It's true that physics and chemistry don't know who's in power. As the meteorologist David Titley says, ice doesn't care about politics, it just melts. But politics is the way we make decisions about how we're gonna live. And science is done by, for, and about people, people who are affected by politics. Remaining apolitical is a luxury that's afforded only to people who feel very safe right now. And defending the status quo seems like the ultimate political statement. Now, I think this doesn't mean that scientists should necessarily be the ones campaigning or making policy. We're not trained in history or communication or sociology or public relations or any other skill set that's crucial to make good decisions. So asking scientists to make policy is like asking a plumber to build a house. You definitely need them there, but you're gonna need a lot more expertise as well. And we live in strange times. The most fortunate of us are trapped inside while others do the essential work of keeping the rest healthy and fed. There are fewer cars on the road and economic activity has ground to a halt. Now I wanna be clear, this is the model for how not to react to the crisis of climate change. Climate change matters because people do. And anything that causes mass suffering and death, I'm not on board with. And while the air in some cities might be cleaner now, that small drop in carbon dioxide emissions means nothing for the climate in the long term. If you have been dosing yourself with poison for decades, injecting a little bit less into your bloodstream isn't going to make you healthy and well. So here's what the science says. There is no such thing as business as usual. Everything is going to change one way or another. If we take no action on coronavirus, millions of us die. If we do, we need to change our economies, our healthcare system, the ways we relate to each other. If we take no action to reduce emissions, there will never be a new normal. The planet we live on is gonna change beneath us and then change again and then change again. And that will give us no time to adapt to any new conditions. But if we do take action, we will have to change the way we generate and use energy which means changing almost every aspect of our society. The real world has given us a choice, but we can't choose to ignore it. There was never a time when we had 12 years to stop climate change. And there is nothing special about the artificial benchmarks we've set for ourselves. We're not safe at 1.5 or two degrees of warming, and we're not doomed if we exceed those targets. But the risk of really scary things increases as the world warms. We can prevent terrible, terrible things by acting now. I think the crisis in which we now find ourselves is a reminder that viruses are stronger than wishful thinking, that the laws of physics are harder to evade than the laws of this country, and that whether or not we wanna be, we're all connected to each other. Thanks. Thank Hi. Thank you so much, Kate. And we've seen in our response to the COVID pandemic um, that evidence-based action is like so important, more important than ever. What do you think that the handling of this crisis could teach us about addressing climate change moving forward? I think something that's been a really painful and hard lesson for me personally to learn as a scientist is that it's not enough to be right. Mm. Um, we're so tempted to be like, but I have an equation, I have a graph. And that's not what changes people's minds. You have to tell stories. You have to reach people where they are. You have to be a communicator and you have to be humble. You know, as scientists, we're sort of taught to believe, you know, we understand everything about this and we don't. And I think being able to recognize other expertise is really, really important here. We've, we've seen that so much with some states that are having people protesting, you know, go, staying inside orders and you go, wow, like I'm so confident in the facts, but if the facts aren't getting through and they're listening to another set of facts and you have another set of actions. And so we, I think there's so much that we can learn. Definitely. 
And you said earlier on in your talk that this is not how we can address climate, how we should address climate change. Like, yes, there are fewer cars in the road, but can you kind of expand upon that idea? Like, why should we address climate change differently? So a lot of people think climate change is just about sacrifice, that you're going to have to give up things that you love. And for a lot of people, it's sacrifice that other people are going to have to make. Oh, if only other people would, would do these things, then we'd all be fine. But I feel like we can't sacrifice our way out of this problem, especially not given who has historically been doing most of the sacrificing. I think addressing climate change means building things. It means building renewables. It means building transmission lines. And it means building kind of a fairer society. Mm. Totally. That makes so much sense. And it's much more hopeful than this idea of just staying inside and doing less you're saying. You should be doing more, which I absolutely love. And I've got what time for one more question. Going back to the idea of media, what is the biggest misunderstanding when it comes to the media's coverage of climate change right now? I feel like there is this notion that either everything is fine or we're totally doomed. And so the truth lies in between those two kind mm. of ridiculous polar extremes. We're not doomed. Our actions really, really, really matter. But at the same time, we can't prevent climate change. It's already happening. Right. But we can make it, we can prevent catastrophe. That's, that's such a good point. I can see that in my own life, kind of going between being like, it's fine, and then being so scared. So I think that's totally. a really good point. Kate, thank you so much for talking with us. And I don't think I ever said my name at the top, so I'm just going to say, <laughs> I'm, I'm Lucy Biggers. I'm a correspondent with Now This and the host of One Small Step, which is a show about sustainability. So thank you guys for letting us be part of this. And Kate, thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye guys.